Okay, everyone, let's start. I will just uh, read the outline. We are going to talk today about the mechanism of sodium transport in the nephron. I'll go uh, through it uh, briefly, then I'll go to the fluid compartments, body fluid compartments, which is uh, very important to understand the hypernatremias. Then we can go to the classifications, and I'll talk briefly about the diuretics effect on sodium specific. So in the basic nephron function, we're going to talk about the nephron. We have the glomerulus in here. We have the Bowman capsule, the PCT, as you know, the loop of Henle, distal tubule, and we have a collecting tubule. So as you can see here, the filtrate will go through the PCT. Most of the PCT, uh, most uh, of the molecules will be reabsorbed uh, in the PCT. So mainly you have 65% of the Na, 65% of the H2O, and about 100% of amino acids and glucose. You have also reabsorption of uh, bicarbonate, which is really important for uh, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, diuretics. In the loop of Henle, we have um, descending. We have uh, the descending part, and you have the ascending part. In the descending part, in the thin, it is really, uh, really permeable for uh, H2O, which is uh, water. And then we can go into the thin loop of Henle. It is not that much significant in reabsorption. However, the thick ascending loop of Henle is really important for uh, the 25% uh, left from the Na. Okay, so uh, most of the Na will be reabsorbed in the proximal. The left will be in the thick ascending, uh, thick ascending tubule of the uh, loop of Henle. Then we go to the distal tubule. You have the early one, and then you have the distal one. The early is similar to the uh, thick ascending loop of Henle, and the distal with the collecting tubule will reabsorb the rest of the water and 5% of the Na. So um, we have the ADH, which is from the posterior pituitary, and we have the aldosterone, which is from the zona glomerulosa from the adrenal cortex, will be secreted and act on the late distal tubule and the collecting duct mainly. Okay, and this is, uh, we have to say that the NAK ATP channels are uh, present in all of the segments to draw the negativity uh, inside the cell of the tubule to uh, allow movement of the other molecules. We will explain it more uh, in the other slides. As you can see in here, we have, I won't uh, read the stuff, but we are going to explain it more so you can understand it. So you have here the basolateral surface, and you have here the luminal surface of the uh, tubular um, nephron. Okay, so in here you have the blood vessel and the interstitial fluid, and here supposedly you have the urine that's going to form. So in the basolateral surface, this is an important thing, which is the Na. K-ATPase channel or co-transport that you're going to have. This is basically will give you uh, three Na to go out with two K uh, entering into the cell, in the PCT cell. So this is will create more positive charges outside the cells and more negative charges inside the uh, in the cell because you are decreasing the positive cations in, inside the cell. So this, the negativity inside the cell, will drive the Na okay, to be co-transported with other molecules inside the cell and then reabsorbed into the blood. So basically, you decrease the positivity of the cell or increase the negativity as you want, and then you have the Na to be co-transported with other molecules like you have here the glucose, you have also amino acid to be co-transported uh, to and reabsorbed into the bloodstream. Okay, so we have also the loop of Henle. As we said, we have the uh, thin, uh, we have the descending, and we have the ascending. So as we said, the descending is mainly permeable for water, no function for Na reabsorption. And then we have the thick ascending, which is mainly the reabsorption of uh, water. So we have here the interstitial or intravascular uh, fluid, and you have here the luminal uh, area or the tubular uh, lumen, as you can see. So in the basolateral surface, we have also the NAK ATPase uh, co-transporter. It will also the same thing as in the PCT will create negativity, increase in the negativity, negative charges that will lead to uh, passive diffusion or channels to move the molecules inside the cell to be reabsorbed. So in the luminous surface, the most important structure in here we have the NAKCL 
uh, co-transporter. It is really important site for the loop diuretic, so it will work on it. We will talk about it uh, at the end of the of the video. So you have here one Na will enter with one K also will enter with it and two Cl to uh, balance the negativity and positive in, inside the cell. So this is mainly in the thick ascending limb of Hindi for transport or uh, reabsorption of sodium. So this is just a summary to show you that the thin descending, it is highly permeable for water, no solutes movement. So because of that, because we don't have solutes movement, it is going to be more smaller because more solutes are found inside the tubule. So as you can see in here, in this uh, slide, you have um, here the uh, descending and ascending. So in the descending, we said it is highly permeable for water, more Na inside the, uh, in the, inside the tubules, which will increase the osmolality. Okay, it will increase the osmolality. In the uh, thin ascending, we said there is no any significant reabsorption. In the thick ascending, we said most of the, N, uh, the left uh, NaCl would be reabsorbed in here, so more solids than water are reabsorbed, so the osmolality will, will decrease. So mainly, we have hyperosmolar inside the uh, tubule in the descending and uh, hypoosmolar in the, um, in the uh, thick um, ascending. Okay, and in the PCT, because of the reabsorption of water and NaCl equally, you, the osmotic, uh, the osmosis or the osmodality uh, won't change in this place. So in the early DCT, as we said, it is structurally or, uh, or functionally similar to the thick ascending uh, loop of Henley. As, uh, as you can see, we have the NaCl, the same mechanism. You will increase the negativity that will drive the co-transport of the Na with the Cl. There is no much to say in here. It is so easy. The late distal and the connecting tubule uh, is similarly functionally uh, the same. So you have here also the NaK uh, ATPase transporter or co-transporter that will drive also, we say the negativity will increase, it will drive passive diffusion of Na through the channel. And it is uh, also uh, here an important site for diuretics we are going to talk about later. So this is mainly for the basic function mechanism of how the sodium is going to be transported and reabsorbed in the nephron, uh, which is really important to know in, into um, which diuretic is going to uh, is going to work in which segment of the nephron. So basically, we are going to talk about the fluid compartments in uh, our body. It's a really important concept you have to understand before you go into hyponatremia's classification. So in our body, we have the extracellular uh, fluid and we have the intracellular fluid, okay? This is basically it. If you want to classify the body into three compartments, okay, you can say that the extracellular fluid is about one third of the, um, of the body compartment. The extra two third is about the intracellular fluid, okay? Then we go to the classification of the extracellular fluid. So basically, you have here extracellular fluid, okay, gonna be classified into intravascular, interstitial, and some books can put for you the uh, transcellular uh, fluid, which for example, it's the, um, uh, the synovial, uh, which is found into the synovial joints, okay? Uh, this is mainly for the classification of the extracellular fluid. Another thing you should know that 63% uh, of the total body weight in a male is uh, composed of water, and about 52% of the female adult is, uh, it is composed of water. And this could be explained because of the fat distribution in female. Okay, then let's talk a little bit about the extracellular fluid in more details. So the extracellular fluid, the main cation found in, in it is the sodium. Okay, so it is the sodium and it controls about 90% of the uh, fluid osmolality, okay, or our body osmolality. And uh, when you have changes in the sodium, okay, you will have changes in the volume and vice versa. So when you add volume, there will be changes in the sodium. You can see here that I classified this uh, box to be here the interstitial fluid, 
okay? And here, the intravascular fluid, okay? And as you see here, this is the intracellular fluid, okay? So the interstitial fluid, it's gonna be about 10 liters, okay? And for the intravascular fluid, it is four liters. The intracellular, it's much more up to 28 liters, okay? This is really important to understand. What's gonna happen uh, before that, you, you have here the semi-permeable membrane in here, okay? So it allows some molecules to pass and some other molecules not to pass. The H2O or the water is the main uh, molecule that can pass freely from the intracellular to the extracellular. So from both sides, you can have H2O moving the, here and there. So you can increase the volume of the extracellular fluid and you can decrease it. This is basically it. So what's going to happen if you have uh, added some water, some pure water, okay? So let's add here some water. No solutes, no sodium, nothing, no electrolyte in it. So you are basically going to increase the volume of the extracellular fluid and relatively the Na will be decreased. So you are going to be like this basically. And you, the intracellular fluid gonna increase because the, um, the volume will go, volume of water will go from the high concentration into the low concentration. So it will, the shift of the H2O will be basically like this, okay, as you can see. So you'll increase the intracellular fluid because you increase the extracellular fluid uh, by water not adding any solute. This is in the case when you add water. So what happens if you add normal saline? So normal saline is basically composed of H2O and sodium at the same time. The same concentration of H2O and the same concentration of sodium. So you are just basically expanding. What are you expanding? You are expanding the extracellular fluid. So you will add this in here, you will increase the volume, the same sodium concentration exactly, so there is, uh, there is no uh, shift of H2O. So the shift of the H2O in here won't happen because it is the same osmolarity uh, of the volume and sodium. So basically it's equal, you are just expanding the extracellular fluids. This is the case what happens when you have a bleeding, uh, a bleeding person, you won't give him just water, water will uh, cause him electrolyte disturbance. You sometimes give them, uh, or you should give them a normal saline because it, uh, it contains the electrolytes and the water. So you will expand the extracellular fluid, which contains the interstitial fluid, as we said, to expand the volume and uh, not causing for him hypotension have to understand the concept because uh, through, through it you will understand the classification of hyponatremias. We are going to uh, talk about each case in specific details and how is the extracellular fluid and intracellular fluid are changing, how is the volume is changing and how is the sodium is changing. And this is so important to know what type of hyponatremias is occurring in the patient. So let's continue about the hyponatremia classification. Just to let you know, we have osmolality and we have uh, tonicity. So they are basically the same, the same value, however the equation is uh, somehow different. But let's say that osmolality and the uh, tonicity is the same, which is 285 to 300 uh, milliosmol per kg. So this is basically the normal osmolality. So the hyponatremous classification are classified according to the tonicity. Okay, so if the tonicity is low, it is called hypotonic. If it is high, you have hypertonic, and if it is neutral, you have the isotonic. And the, when you say that you have a hyponatremia, if the sodium concentration at the plasma is less than 35 millimole per liter. So this is basically the basic information about hyponatremias. So we have isotonic, hypertonic, and hypotonic. In the hypotonic, we'll take some, uh, some time on it because we have classification for it, the hypovolemic, hypervolemic, and isovolemic. So let's begin with the isotonic part. Okay, for the isotonic hyponatremia, you can see that the isotonic hyponatremia, we are basically having a lab error. 
take it as a lab error because the old machines are uh, measuring the sodium in the plasma as a whole. Okay, so you have the uh, old lab machines are measuring the, um, the sodium in the whole plasma. So when you have here a normal blood vessel, okay, this is a normal blood vessel, the normal ratio of it that you have in 93% of it is aqueous, aqueous part which contains the sodium. However, you have 7% only that contains proteins, contains lipid, which is mainly triglyceride. So what happens in, in abnormal uh, uh, situations, primarily when you have high blood uh, profile, uh, hypertriglyceridemia, or you, when you have high proteins, this percentage in here, it increases to more than 7%. And the aqueous part, it becomes less, so you contain less sodium uh, relatively to the uh, lipids and uh, proteins. So what gives you a, is the uh, lab machine shows you that the sodium is relatively decreased according to the concentration of the whole plasma, not only the aqueous part. However, our machines now are only measuring the concentration of the uh, sodium in the aqueous part. So now, nowadays, you uh, rarely see a patient with uh, isotonic hyponatremia, but you have to check. So uh, it is called also a pseudo-hyponatremia. The patient doesn't have really a hyponatremia, however, the lab shows you that uh, he has relatively low uh, sodium concentration. So this is basically what I have said. So for the hypertonic hyponatremias, so uh, basically what you have in here, we said the uh, extracellular fluid, okay, so you have here the extracellular fluid and the intracellular fluid as we said. We said here we have the volume, you have the Na concentration. When you add tonicity to the extracellular fluid, so you are adding more tonic molecules or acti um, uh, active molecule, osmotically active molecules, for example, glucose is the most important one, and you have mannitol, okay? So you are act actively adding more osmo uh, osmotic molecules into the extracellular fluid. You are expanding the volume, however, you are uh, increasing the tonicity. So the t tonicity is increasing in here. So more concentration of molecules appearing in the extracellular fluid. So naturally what happens is the H2O, which is in the intracellular fluid, will shift into the extracellular fluid to dilute this osmotic concentration. So you have more H2O going into the extracellular fluid, you will increase the volume However, the, uh, when you did the dilution, the concentration of the Na went down relatively to the additional, um, additional water. So what you have here, more volume, okay, however, you have less sodium. So this is relative, relative to the volume that you added because of the osmotically active molecules and uh, which happens mainly because of glucose and mannitol. So let's see in here you have the substances that increases the tonicity, mainly glucose, as we said, mannitol, which is a diuretic. We are going to talk about it. Uh, it is the only diuretic that causes hypertonic hyponatremias. The rest of the diuretics causes hypotonic hyponatremias. Other things we have ethylene glycol and toluene. So as a result of more H2O going, as we said, we will lower the Na relatively. This is the case what happens in DKA or diabetic ketoacidosis and hyperglycemia. So when you correct this case, you want to know after you correct the hyperglycemia, what is the concentration of Na that's going to appear for you. So we have an equation, a simple equation. We have the glucose measured in this patient. Okay, It is subtracted by uh, 100 and divided by 660. Uh, okay? Then you add the Na that is measured for this patient. Okay, Then you will have the Na corrected. Uh, th th that should be corrected after you neutralize his hyperglycemia. This is really important that you have to correct the sodium very slowly to prevent the per a permanent uh, neuronal damage, which is uh, central pontine myelinolysis. So let's begin with the hypotonic hyponatremia. It's uh, the most important one because when the patient presents, it's about like 90% of the patients have this type of hyponatremia, not the isotonic, not the hypertonic. Uh, so let's go through it. So the hyponatremia, okay, so it is, as we said, less than 30, 135. 
When you have the hypotonic, it is classified into hypovolemic, hypervolemic, and isovolemic. Let's see something. Okay, so basically the concentration of, um, of sodium when you have it, okay, so you have here Na, okay, concentration, is equal to the Na, okay, in the serum or, or extracellular fluid over the water, okay? So basically what happened in the first case, okay, so you have decrease in both volume, okay, so you have volume depletion and also sodium. So this is the case where it happened in, if you have vomiting or diarrhea um, or bleeding, so you have decrease in the sodium as well as the water, both of them. So this is low volume as well as uh, uh, hyponatremia. The other case when you have the sodium concentration, okay, so this is the Na, we have water, okay, this is W for water, then you go for when you have both of them are up, okay, so water is up and sodium is up, however, the water is more uh, or the volume is more expanded than you added the sodium. These are uh, in cases of um, uh, intra, uh, intra arterial uh, volume depletion as what happened in congestive heart failure. So you have increased in the volume more than the sodium, so you have relatively decreased in sodium concentration in the extracellular fluid. So you have more volume. So this is the hypervolemic case. The third case, okay, which is the isovolemic. Uh, it's a, a little bit confu confusing. So you have here the Na and you have the water. The problem is in here that you have increase in the water, minimal increase in the water. However, you don't have any change in the concentration of the uh, of the Na. You didn't add, you didn't uh, remove any Na. However, with this increase, okay, you have a relative um, relative decrease of sodium in the extracellular fluid. So this is isovolemic, okay? To make it more apparent, okay, in the isovolemic, I'll just throw you something in here, okay? You know, this is the sodium and this is the volume, okay? Now I'll draw my um, extracellular fluid and intracellular fluid in here, okay? Then when we add some minimal water in here, okay, this is basically what's gonna happen. We are adding volume, okay? Sodium didn't change. However, because we have here high concentration of H2O, the H2O will go from the high concentration to the low concentration to neutralize it. So you have here H2O shift, okay? So basically the volume will decrease from here and decrease the sodium also to go. So this is the isovolemic. So let's uh, t talk in details more about the hypovolemic hyponatremia. So basically, you lose in here volume, you lose volume in here, okay, as well as sodium concentration. So both of them is going to be loose. Um, so this is a very simple situation, the most easy one and uh, the easiest one of the three. So lose volume and you lose um, um, sodium concentration. So we have renal causes, non-renal causes, okay? Uh, for the renal causes, how do you measure it? You measure it through the um, sodium concentration in urine. If it is more than 20, this is renal for, for sure. If it is less than 20, this is non-renal. And uh, it goes also for the uh, hypervolemic uh, state. The same thing, you uh, measure the sodium in urine and uh, for that you will determine either it is renal or non-renal causes. So the basic thing in the renal uh, causes, you have, um, you have the diuretics. All of the diuretics causes hypervolemic hyponatremia except for mannitol. We said that mannitol causes hypertonic hyponatremia, not hypovolemic hyponatremia. So uh, also we have Addison's disease because Addison's disease will have decrease in the uh, sodium as well as decrease uh, in the volume because of the uh, decrease uh, of aldosterone. 
Then we have uh, non-renal causes. The basic one is the diarrhea and vomiting, and it is the most important one. If you have excess sweating, if you have urinary obstruction, burns and trauma, because mo most of the extracellular fluid in the trauma and burns are uh, susceptible to the outside environment. Then you have signs and symptoms, okay? So uh, most of the patients, you will find them dehydrated. However, the GVP is not raised. And this is a very important question to differentiate between the hypovolemic and the hypervolemic hyponatremia. So in the hypo, you don't find any raised GVP. The, no, the treatment is um, very simple. You have to give them normal saline. As we said, normal saline contain uh, equal concentrations of Na and uh, water. Okay, and uh, sometimes you have to repl replace the potassium because most common cause of hypovolemic hyponatremia is diuretics. The most uh, potent one and the most commonly used is loop diuretics. Okay, so loop diuretics also causes hypokalemia, and we are going to see how is that happening. Let's see the second type, which is uh, the hypervolemic hyponatremia. As we said, we have increase in the water, okay, and uh, increase in the sodium. However, you have more increase in the water, more than the sodium. So basically, in the beginning, you will have increase in water, okay, and increase in the sodium, both at the same time. Okay, but however, when the uh, when the water goes from the high concentration to the low concentration in here and the int intracellular fluid, okay, you will have increase in the volume and decrease in the sodium after before the shift of the H two O. However, you have to remember here that the most important thing, both the Na and the water, at uh, increasing at the same time. The water is more than the Na because uh, because of that you have the hyponatremia because it's relative to the increase of the water. You have the same thing, renal causes, non-renal causes according to the output of the sodium in the urine. 20, uh, if it is more than 20, uh, so this is renal. If it is less than 20, this is non-renal. And then uh, the most common renal cause is acute renal failure. So this is acute renal failure will cause you hypervolemic hyponatremia because you will retain water. The same thing with the non-renal causes. Uh, the most common cause is congestive heart failure. So you have retaining of water, less sodium, um, uh, less sodium in the body relative to the water contained. You have also liver failure. You have nephrotic syndrome. So basically, these patients, they have intra-arterial uh, volume depletion, which is going to trigger the ADH and aldosterone. So ADH is going to be uh, stimulated to increase the water, and the aldosterone is going to be stimulated to increase the sodium. So let's go to the signs and symptoms. So the patient mainly comes uh, with weight gain, okay, because of the edema that he has. So basically put the picture of congestive heart failure patient in your mind. Weight gain, edema, and high GVP. So as we said here, high GVP is very important to differentiate it from uh, the uh, hypo hypovolemic hyponatremia. So the treatment is going to be through drugs, which are diuretics, okay, and uh, restrict uh, the fluid intake. The third type is the isovolemic hyponatremia. So the isovolemic hyponatremia, when you have the Na, okay, didn't change at all. However, you have some slight increase in the water, okay? So when you have the slight increase in the water, so just slight minimal increase in the water in here, and the water is going from the high concentration to the low concentration in, in order to neutralize the, uh, the amount of water. However, before this neutralization to happen, you will have also a relative hyponatremia in here because of the increased volume. The main cause of this, the main, really main cause, is the uh, syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion. Because they have ADH, they retain water, okay? And there is no aldosterone to work to reserve the uh, Na. The Na concentration is normal. There is reabsorption, normal reabsorption, normal secretion of the sodium. However, the ADH is working to retain more water than the normal. That's why you have the hyponatremia. Other causes cause um, small cell carcinoma, brain trauma, 
polydipsia and some drugs, which is important to know, chlor chlorpamide and oxytocin causes uh, isovolemic hyponatremia. Also, the H2 ir irrigation in the prostate um, surgery, uh, the, the normal saline when they irrigated in the, uh, during the surgery, during the prostate surgery may cause iso isovolemic hyponatremia. Signs and symptoms, this is the problem with the isovolemic. It mimics a lot of diseases. Some of them are thyroid, it mimics the thyroid sometimes. Sometimes it mimics the pituitary, uh, uh, pituitary uh, lesions, and also for the sciatica, which is the syndrome of inappropriate uh, ADH secretion, is related to many other diseases: CNS, GI, lungs, a lot of things. Uh, it's a whole bunch of stuff you, you can relate it to this syndrome. And uh, the treatment is mainly water restriction plus the cause should be uh, treated also. So this is uh, the clinical presentation of hyponatremia. You have to know the most important thing that uh, most of the patients present asymptomatically, okay? Then you have here the investigations. The main, um, the main investigation is plasma and urine electrolyte and osmolality. This is the most important thing. And other investigations, if you suspect Addison, if you suspect hypothyroidism, Sayada, any drug-induced water retention, and uh, check also for the drugs of the patient. Now, this is a summary. Just to make it uh, clear, we have here the hyponatremia. It is classified according to the uh, according to the osmolality uh, of the of the plasma. So you have here isotonic, hypertonic, and hypotonic. Let's go for the isotonic and just summarize it. It's a lab error caused by high triglyceridemia and uh, high proteins. It is called pseudo hyponatremia. So then the hypertonic, hypertonic, it is increased tonicity of the extracellular fluid because of high uh, tonic molecule, osmotically active molecule, for example, glucose and mannitol, and you will see it in DKA and hypergly uh, hyperglycemia cases. Then we go for the hyper, uh, hypotonic, which is the most common one. 90% of the patients ap appears hypotonic. We have three classification. We have hypotonic, uh, hypovolemic, hypervolemic, and isovolemic. For the hypovolemic, uh, you have both the NA and water are decreasing. Hypo hypervolemic, both of them are increasing. And isovolemic, there is no change in the sodium. The water is just um, increasing. Uh, all of them have renal and non-renal causes according to the output of the sodium in the urine. Uh, the most important thing you have to remember that always you have always to correct the sodium slowly. Okay, so this is uh, you have to put it in mind. You have to correct it slowly to prevent any uh, permanent uh, nerve loss or neuronal uh, cell loss because it can cause central pontine myelinolysis. This is a very important question. So this is uh, the next objective and our last objective, the diuretic action. I'll talk specifically about the sodium and not any other electrolytes. So as you can see in here, we excluded one category of diuretic, which is carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. So it's not working on the sodium. It will work on the bicarbonate specifically. So let's begin in our diuretics. The first one is um, mannitol. So as you can see here, we talked about it in the hypertonic hyponatremia, and it is one of the side effects of this uh, molecule or this drug. It works mainly in the PCT. It works also on the uh, collecting tubules. And uh, some effect also happens on the, uh, thick, uh, on the descending loop of Henley. So this is mainly for mannitol. It is easy, and it is the only one that causes hypertonic hyponatremia. All of the other ones of diuretics causes hypovolemic hyponatremia. I'll explain more about it. Then we go for the loop diuretics. So the loop diuretics are the most important one and most of the exam questions comes on it. So the loop diuretics mainly acts on the thick ascending. So it's in here, as you can see, furosemide, mimetonide, ethacranic acid, all of them are loop diuretics. They act on the thick ascending loop of Henle, and the most important thing about them, they are working on NAK2Cl symporter. So the main name of it is NKCC2 symporter. Okay. Uh, another thing happening in here in the loop of Henle that there is reabsorption of magnesium and calcium because of the NA also. So the NA will drive. Um, 
uh, Na and K will drive the reabsorption of the magnesium and calcium into the blood again through um, uh, diffusion through the tight junctions. So one of the side effects because of the loop diuretics it will cause you a volume depletion, okay, so it will cause volume depletion, it will cause low sodium and other electrolytes. What other electrolytes? As you can see here, it will cause to you low potassium, okay, so let's see in here, you can see here low potassium, low magnesium, and low calcium. So basically, the side effects is going to be hypovolemic, hypotonic hyponatremia type, okay, and we're going to cause hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, and hypocalcemia. And this is the most important diuretic. Um, okay, then we can go to the thiazide, thiazide one. The thiazide also a little bit more, um, it is important, but less than the loop diuretic, because it's not usually used really as a diuretic. It is used for uh, hypertension mainly, okay? Uh, not used for edema, not for fluid retention uh, treatment, mainly for hypertension. And it is mainly acting on the uh, DCT or the distal convoluted tubules. The thing is, the thing that's happening in here, that um, if we can zoom in here, okay, in the distal convoluted tubule, okay, we can add in here that there is excretion, okay, or it is in here. You have an excretion of the calcium. The one with thiazide, the most important thing that it inhibits the excretion of uh, calcium which uh, is going to be um, an advantage for thiazide when you use it for renal stones because of most of the renal stones are con containing calcium. So most of them uh, contains calcium. Uh, when you inhibit the calcium excretion, you will decrease the deposition of calcium in the urinary tract. Okay, then uh, the last one that we have is the potassium sparing diuretics. The potassium sparing diuretics, it is mainly um, classified into aldosterone antagonists and we have the NA channel inhibitors. So the, uh, the aldosterone antagonist, it is self-explainable, it inhibits the aldosterone, retains um, so it inhibits the, uh, the uh, NA retention or um, reabsorption and causes K or potassium um, retention, okay? So this is not how we're talking here. We will talk mainly about the NA channel inhibitors, which is going to work on the collecting tubule, okay? It's going to work on the collecting tubule and the late distal tubule. It will work on the epithelial, okay? NA channels, so epithelial sodium channels in the collecting tubule mainly and some of the distal convoluted tubule. So it will inhibit the reabsorption of, uh, of uh, sodium as simple as that. So those are the main class, uh, classes uh, of diuretics working on sodium. Uh, the most important one to say is the loop diuretic uh, acting with the NKCC2 symporter and the thiazides which are um, working on the NCC uh, symporter. Uh, the loop diuretics causes a lot of side effects, uh, including other electrolyte disturbances, hypokalemia, which can contribute to muscle weakness, uh, and calcium hypocalcemia, which can affect the heart, uh, the heart function, and many other things. The thiazide, the most important thing <clears throat> that it inhibits the calcium excretion in the distal convoluted tubule, so it can be used as a treatment for uh, uh, renal stones not to deposit more calcium in the stones.